everyone, and welcome to part two of our introductory video to this lecture series on data science for dynamical systems. In part one, we have learned a bit about dynamical systems and how they are described mathematically. We started with what we called an ordinary differential equation, ODE, which means that we have a system state X, which is time dependent, and the rule to describe how the system evolves over time is given by this ODE, which means X dot, the time derivative of X, is equal to f of x, which is a right-hand side, which can in general be an arbitrary nonlinear function of the state. And we started out with this very simple model where we had this apple that starts to fall at some point in time, and its state x is composed of the height of the apple and its velocity. And then we derived using Newton's law an ODE, a right-hand side that describes how the height changes over time, which is the velocity itself, and how the velocity changes over time, which is the acceleration, which was given by the gravity here. And so we see in this very simple setting, everything is known, everything is easily modelable. And given such an ODE, we can make predictions into the future. We have not covered this topic in detail yet, but we will get there and see how, given an ODE, we can make predictions into the future using numerical methods or also, for some systems, analytical methods. But now comes in the data science part of our lecture series. What we want to consider is different situations where it is not so easy to model the system. And we're going to point out a few examples where data is really relevant to give a, a motivation and overview of the topics that we are going to cover in this lecture series. And so part one or point one that may occur is the question of parameter identification. Uh, this means that our right hand side f of x is known. And known in itself would obviously be boring. What I mean by known is that the structure of our right hand side may be known, but maybe some parts are not known, and in this case, parameters like the gravitational constant g. Okay, so in this example that we considered, uh, we did not talk about the absolute height of this tree. So maybe it stands at a coast or maybe it stands on a very high mountain. And depending on where it is, this gravitational constant changes slightly. And maybe we are interested in very accurate solutions. So we don't know what G really is. And here comes in the data. So let's consider measurements of this system. Right? So the height over time would decrease quadratically. We have this parabolic profile and the velocity over time increases linearly during the situation where the apple is falling. When it, when it hits the ground, obviously things change, but let's consider the, the falling part only, where we see this situation, parabolic decrease of the height, linear increase of the velocity. And what we can do now is we take measurements of the system. Okay, so we do not know the continuous trajectory, but at some discrete points in time, we know the height. And maybe in this first setting, we also know the velocity. So we have measurements over time, and we can now use these to learn, or use machine learning or other data-driven techniques to identify these parameter values and then make predictions. Right, so this would be one opportunity to use the data, but there might be also additional ones where the right-hand side of our model might be even unknown structurally. In this case, we have another opportunity, which is what we call model, identification where our f of x our right hand side is completely unknown in this previous newton apple example we have been able to describe the right hand side by first uh, principle approach but let's consider a more abstract uh, example where this is not so easily possible and let's take an example from national economy where i want to model the change of the interest rate over time. So the interest rate i would be here our state. And we describe this as a right hand side f of i of t, so the interest rate. And we also consider some uh, input here to the system, which we call m of t, which is the monetary action of some central bank, which is responsible for the 
uh, economic uh, behavior. This right-hand side in this economic example is normally not easily describable in contrast to our Newton's apple principle. So what we can also do again is we can uh, go into some data-driven modeling. So we can have a look on the monetary actions over time of the central bank. So let's say every couple of months or whatsoever, the monetary actions are changed. And we can observe how the interest rate of some national economy, so I of T, is changing over time. So let's say it has some behavior like this. And we can also take, of course, again, measurements, observations of the inputs and the state response and utilize these data points in order trying to not only model some parameters of F, but the entire structure of F, which we could, for example, do by applying some black box machine learning models. Okay, so these are two, let's say, extreme situations. So we first know the right-hand side altogether, just a few parameters are known, we know nothing about the system. But there are, of course, uh, also intermediate situations, which we denote by residual identification. Which means that our f of x is partly known. What do I mean by this? Let's consider the Apple example once more. We have seen that using Newton's law, we were able to derive a closed form uh, description of the right-hand side of our ODE. We have a term for the velocity, we have a term for the acceleration. But what we did not consider was the air drag during the Apple falling. So maybe there is the case that this right-hand side that we have modeled is just F1 of X, and it consists of a second term f2 of x that we do not know at all. Okay, So this, in my little example, this was the air drag that we don't know. So some parts may be easily accessible using uh, physical laws and, and simple enough modeling strategies, but parts may be entirely unknown. So this gives us an intermediate version of, of both examples. And again, we can use data to use what's called also discrepancy learning to find the part of the model that cannot be modeled as easily. So this gives us three very interesting settings where we want to learn the right-hand side given measurements of x. But what we also may have is the situation where we are not in the situation that we can measure everything. Okay? So in this case, state estimation becomes an important question. Now we are not talking about f of x, but what we are going to say is that x of t is partially measurable only. What do I mean by this? Look at the apple once more and consider maybe a series of snapshots or photos that we are going to take. And it is very easy to measure the height of this apple, but maybe it is much, much harder to get an accurate estimate of the velocity. So we may, and these situations become more uh, complicated when we have systems of higher dimensions or more complex dynamics, some quantities may be easily accessible and measurable, and in this case the height, and some may be very hard to measure. So this is the situation where x is only partially measurable, and we will also extend our state space model by an observable equation to make this mathematically more precise, but in this case, you know, partial measurements can be used, again, using tools from, from machine learning to estimate the entire state of the system. So this is then another or the fourth situation where data comes in very handy. Okay, last but not least, we will also consider data in order to do efficient modeling. Why is that important? So here in our 
examples which we had, we had very uh, low order models where we had just like two states and here we had like one input and one state. And as we will see in one of the following up lecture series, in order to calculate the state response, the system response using analytical and numerical methods for such low order models, uh, that is very handy and can be done um, numerically very easily. But of course we also have systems where we might have thousands or even millions of states. For example, if we are interested in a model of the entire global economy, not only of the interest rate of one economy in one nation, or if we're interested into not only uh, two states of a very simple system, but maybe in many, many states of a much more complex system for mechatronics and so on. In this case, to calculate the system response, analytically or numerically might be very expensive and we can utilize data in order to find an efficient way of modeling it and therefore trying to speed up calculations which might be important for simulating complex systems like global economy or climate change over long times. And therefore we have seen that we can utilize data in order to really do much in terms of dynamical systems and improve models or come up with models which we do not know yet, uh, yet have, or even speed up modeling and simulation processes using data. Okay, so thanks for watching these two introductory videos. We hope that you now share our enthusiasm for data science and dynamical systems. And these points are what we're going to address in a lot of detail in the upcoming parts of our lecture series, not only conceptually, but we will also cover this using the very popular programming language Julia and go into details how to implement these methods. And so stay tuned for the upcoming videos and you will learn all about these particular tools and how to learn data in combination with dynamical systems.